So of course, as soon as I finished up that last bit of video, part one, getting all your data into R, I realized why it's such a good idea to use this header function. This line over here had actually read 0, 0.00 and it should have read 0, 0.20. That's because I had an old version of this file where in my you know fake data I had put in a zero and then I thought, well, that's funny. Nobody would ever walk into a library and stay for zero hours. Um, if they sat down at all, they would be sitting there for some amount of time, most likely. So I went in and changed the fake data, but I hadn't saved the file. So now the file is saved, and I'm pulling from the correct file for the rest of the example. So the next thing we want to do is subset our data into two groups, our control group and our experimental group. This wouldn't be necessary if our groups were in separate columns. We could just use the separate column headers. But since our PH Lab data is formatted like this, I'm going to show you how to do it. Once you have this script, it's not hard to do. So we've got our continuous header. That's our dependent variable measured header. And that was ours with a capital H. That capital letter is very important to match up. And then we had our grouping header, which was cell with a capital C. And for our control group, we're going to look at the no cell group, and we want to see if cell phones change that time spent in the library. So for our experimental group, we're going to look at that same continuous header, the hours, under the same grouping header, cell. Only this time, we're looking at those hours labeled cell rather than no cell. So we have an experimental group label and a control group label. And so we need to run both of those lines of code. And I'm just hitting control R to run those lines of code. And then I can check to see if I'm looking at the right line of code. So I'm actually going to add a header function here since it was so handy last time. Check a header of your groups. So that would be head of control group and head of experimental group. These are just objects that I'm naming and using here. And so I can look and I can look back at the data and see 0.75 for no cell, 1.75, 1.2, 7.5, 1 1.5 and 5, that looks good, and 5, 1, 5, one and probably a one. I'm not going to scroll down just to save a little time. But so now we've verified that we are actually looking at what we want to be looking at. So take out that line of file or that line of script there. So I checked my header. And then to check the summary, this is going to give us a little bit of that descriptive statistics. and some measure of central tendency. So when I run those, I'm going to get an idea of the range, the min to the max, and the quartiles, and especially the mean. And since I'm comparing the means with a t-test, and I'm looking at the means right now, these means do not look very different. Not at all. So I'm not expecting to see a significant difference between these two groups. But just for teaching purposes, I'm going to keep going. No matter what, it's always good to have a sense of the spread of your data, what your data looks like. And so a histogram is a really good tool for that. Before you run your tests, get an idea of what your data looks like. You're more likely to catch any errors in your tests or, you know, there, there can be human error. You can input something wrong. So it's always good to have some notion of what's happening. And so we're going to take our combined range of data. So we're going from the combination of the control group and experimental groups, so the lowest value of those two groups, to the highest value of those two groups. And I've set my length out to be 24. I want to break it into 24 bins. And I'm actually going to change that. Our max is 6 hours. So I'm going to do every half hour. So I'm going to break that into 12 bins. So that length out argument changes the number of bins. So we're working from about 0 to about 6. So 12 bins will give us a good approximation of half hours.
And so we have graphing parameters we're going to need to set now. And I've set them for you, but if you ever wanted to change them, I've just given you a little bit of what these mean. But if I run that bins line, and then I run my parameters line, you're going to see a, a box pop up. That is for our graph. And the important thing about this, these parameters I've set, um, I've given myself a little more room in the margins. And I've also set it up to have our first graph pop up at the top and our second graph pop up at the bottom so that we can actually look at our control and our experimental groups top to bottom. So stacked on top of each other for easy comparison. So we're going to plot the continuous variable. So it's already set up to run our control group. So I'm going to run that line and my histogram pops up. And we can add titles to this like control group or I could change that but I'm, I'm just going to leave it actually. And frequency along the y-axis. That side equals 2 is telling it to put it on that side. And I'm going to plot my experimental group also with my labels. And this is just a generic X label, so I will change that to hours spent studying. Run that line and run the final line. So I don't know about you, but these histograms are looking pretty similar to me. I'm not expecting to see a lot of difference in the means of these two populations. But I'm going to go ahead and run my impaired t-test just because I want to show you how this works. Um, and because for your IBIT projects, even if your data does end up looking this similar, we're going to want you to run a t-test just for practice. Um, generally, you may not be seeking to publish if your data looked like this, and so you may stop here um, if you were working in a lab. But I'm going to go ahead. This is set up to run the difference in my first minus my second mean. So it's going to give me a negative number if I don't set this up to have the group with the higher mean, which is my control group first. So that's correct as it is. So control group minus experimental group. I run that line and get my results. So Sure enough, just as it looked in the histogram, the just pulling a random sample from a population or two groups, if there were no difference in the groups, would get us this set of numbers or a set of numbers like this 88 out of every 100 times that we looked at those two groups. So there is no significant difference between these two groups. That is a very high p-value when our alpha is 0.05. So we're going to, our p is greater than 0.05, so we're going to report no difference between our two group means. But you can see our output here. Well, we might talk more about confidence intervals later. You get your two means. It calculates the degrees of freedom. I'm going to teach you how to do that um, by hand as well. And you get a test statistic here. So that's where I'm going to end this video and pick back up with the